today on the Lowdown, a dancing groom podcast, Chloe Cartwheel and Dr. Nick Alaskowitz gives us the Lowdown on dancing groom and Alzheimer's disease. Over to you, Hannah and Morella. Hello, everyone. My name is Hannah Mahmoud, co-host of the Lowdown podcast and the lead occupational therapist at the Down Syndrome Resource Foundation. Joining me today, as always, is my wonderful co-host, um, SLP at the DSRF, Marla Folden. Hi, Marla. Hello. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I, I'm doing really well. I'm kind of shocked, yeah. actually, that we're on season five. That has gone very fast. I know. I was just going to say, yeah, we've, we've gone through gone through a lot of episodes, and this one is a big one that we've been um, trying to get organized, so I'm very excited for our guests today. Uh, but before we continue on with our episode, we would love for you to hit that subscribe button and leave a review of our podcast on your chosen podcast platform. Remember to check out our episode pages for additional resources related to each episode. You can also follow the DSRF at www.dsrf.org and on Instagram at Twitter by following at DSRF Canada. Okay, so today we are going to speak about an area that's actually relatively new for the population of people with Down syndrome, older adulthood. And I know this is a conversation, Marla, you and I have all the time with respect Mm -hmm. to um, the families that we see at the DSRF as well. Yeah. And I mean, we, we usually know people kind of in a, on a lifelong basis. So, uh, you know, we start with people when they're sometimes before they're even born and up through high school graduation and into adulthood, but older adulthood is a relatively new concept for individuals with down syndrome. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, you may have heard that the life expectancy for people with Down syndrome has increased dramatically, and that is absolutely correct. In 1960, the average life expectancy was 10 years old, I can't imagine. And as recently as even 1980, the life expectancy was just 25 years. Now, the average life expectancy is 60 or more for many adults with Down syndrome. Um, so many of these gains you know, can be attributed to advances in medical care, particularly in early life. Um, alongside medical care, public knowledge and support has, and, you know, and research as well, has made great gains over the same time period. Mm-hmm. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we've, I think Down syndrome is on the map not only for the people who work in the community, but I think the population at large is at least aware of Down syndrome now, um, which has contributed a lot to quality of life, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the awareness component of it is so important because that is when, you know, the research will happen and all the all the work towards it. So the result of all of this is that more individuals with Down syndrome live fulfilling lives into their older adult years um, in the same way that medical and social supports help people with Down syndrome thrive in their younger years. These same supports are needed as a person with DS ages. Mm-hmm. That's true. And so today we have the pleasure of speaking with two people. Um, The first is Chloe Cottrell, who's a social worker, and she's a clinical social worker at Mass General. Ooh, I love Mass General. I'm so excited. Yeah, Um, I know. In the Syndrome Support Program in Boston. And Chloe provides behavioral health and mental wellness consultation and family support and care coordination and resources to families across the lifespan. And we also have Dr. Nicholas Oreskovich, who's an internist and pediatrician and clinical researcher. He's the assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and the medical director for the Integrated Care Management Program at Mass General. Again, yay who? Uh, and it's a clinical program that helps to coordinate and improve care for patients with multiple complex medical conditions like Down syndrome. Dr. Oreskovich cares for patients of all ages in his primary care practice, as well as adults with Down syndrome in the MGH Down syndrome program. His research interests include physical activity and other health behaviors, chronic disease prevention and management, and using technology to improve health behaviors and healthcare delivery, as well as understanding how the built environment, including architecture and urban planning, can affect both individual and population level health. These are the perfect people to talk this subject. Exactly. So welcome yes. to both of you to the lowdown. Thank you for having us. I can say this is a Chloe Cottrell. I listen to your podcast. I'm a big fan and I often share resources with our patients and families. So I'm excited to be here today and it's a privilege. Thank you. Oh, thank you. 
such high praise. <laughs> Welcome to you too, Dr. Oreskovich. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. We're very excited to be here. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a wonderful opportunity to discuss these really important topics with you. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. And this this particular subject, not a lot of information gets out very, very easily, I guess you could say. So we're happy to bring this information to the public in the best way that we can. Um, typically on our podcast, we start with five, what we'll call secret questions, um, just so the listeners get to know you a little bit. So let's go for it. First question is, what is the best toast topping? Who goes first? Go for it. Chloe. Why don't you take it away, Chloe? Oh, I'm pretty boring. Um, I just like old fashioned, really good Irish butter. Mm, nice. I don't think that's Irish boring, butter. but it's delicious. With a cup of coffee. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> This is why Chloe and I get along so well together uh, in the clinic. I, I'm a traditionalist. I'm going to say butter as well. Really? Yeah. I can tell you guys are not from the West Coast. There's only one answer over here, and it's avocado. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, that's so funny. If The second question is, if your Monday had a theme song, what would the theme song be? Nicholas, why don't you start this time? Wow, I was not prepared for these questions. Um, <laughs> Nicholas should be prepared for this question. He yeah. likes to sing in clinics. So I do. So oh, a music guy. Um, my fun day, huh? Um, I, I don't think this would be the theme, but the only song that's popping into my head right now is It's Raining Men, so I'm going to have to go with that. <laughs> okay, great. That's a fun song. <laughs> that's, yeah, that would, that would get your Monday going. It's a nice upbeat song. Why not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about huh, I can't think of a song, but this uh, today was my Monday because we had a holiday and I don't have a song, but I'll, I'll just say that I have a swagger playlist and it's usually anything on that playlist. Nice. Excellent. Make an entrance Love it. to work, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> like Use that. your imagination. Okay. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. I'm going to take over for the next couple of questions. Um, Chloe, why don't you start off um, this time? What are you currently reading? It could be a book, audiobook. Uh, I'm not currently reading anything. I'm a big uh, podcast sort of addict, I would say. So I think I'm currently making my way through um, the Radical Justice podcast that talks about, and we don't need to get political, but the uh, event in the Capitol and kind of uh, the yeah. background of that. So that's what I'm currently listening to. Okay. Yeah. And Nicholas? Uh, I'm just about to finish uh, Barack Obama's Promised Land, uh, which is a big accomplishment. It's quite a lengthy book and a lot of politics <laughs> in there. So um, it's taken me quite some time to read it, but I'm, I have about 10 pages left and I'm going to savor them tonight. Very cool. Excellent. I know both husband and wife are really great writers. I've read Michelle Obama's book and it's, it's really, really good. Um, okay, the next question is a little controversial. Um, pineapple, does it belong on a pizza or not? Nicholas, why don't you take this one first? That is a great question and very controversial. <laughs> and even in, within my household, there are dissenting opinions. Oh, no. um, but um, uh, w before I had children, I would have said absolutely not. But since then, I've, I've discovered the beauty of pineapple on, on pizza. Yeah. And when, exactly. when counterbalanced with some jalapeno, it really plays yes. an important and vital role on that pizza slice. Exactly. Great. Chloe, what about you? I'm right, less nuanced. Less nuanced. It's a flat out no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! So if you guys have office pizza parties, you know it, it could come to blows if there's pineapple on there. <laughs> well, remember not to order pizza at those parties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Not worth it. <laughs> Excellent. <All right. laughs> um, last question. You'd be surprised. There are some strong opinions on this too. What is your favorite writing implement? Hina in particular has strong opinions on this one. Yeah, I'm very picky about my pens. For everyday use or just like your ever all-time favorite? However you want to interpret the question um, is fun. I don't use them for everyday use, but in my, I do a little crafting and I like Japanese Posca pens, oh, well. P-O-S-C-A. They're very well made. Ooh, very cool. Very nice. Nicholas, in all your, and I'm sure you do lots of note-taking throughout your day. <laughs> I do. So um, I actually, my favorite utensil is my fountain pen. 
Um, yeah. so oh. I, uh, I grew up using a fountain pen. I, I grew up in Paris. Um, and to this day, I still enjoy using the fountain pen. Love it. Great. Yeah. Everybody has an opinion on that one. I like it. A yeah. lot. Um, well, thank you for indulging us in those early questions. I feel like our listeners out there know you a tiny bit now, which is great. And with that aside, we shall dive right into the aging process for individuals with Down syndrome. So I think we'll start with how does the aging process for people with Down syndrome differ from the typically developing population? So that, that's a really great question, Marla. So, you know, we know that adults with Down syndrome, as you mentioned, are now living longer and, and fuller lives. Um, and currently, as you mentioned, with the average life expectancy of individuals with Down syndrome, it is not uncommon uh, for individuals to live into their 60s. Um, in fact, during our last clinic session that Chloe and I had uh, last week, we had two patients uh, in their late 60s uh, on, on our uh, clinic day scheduled. So um, we are seeing patients live longer with Down syndrome, which is really wonderful. Um, and along with that, we do see some uh, unique conditions that can start to present uh, during later adulthood. One thing that we know is that there is a genetic link between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's uh, type disease, Alzheimer's type dementia. Um, and adults with Down syndrome tend to experience uh, syndromes of accelerated aging as well, which means that in their 40s and their 50s, uh, they can experience certain conditions that are seen in elderly adults in the general population. So uh, we may see conditions uh, in start to develop when our patients are 40 or 50 or 60 that we typically might not see until a little bit later, uh, decades of 70s or 80s, uh, or even 90s in the general population. There are some common medical conditions uh, in aging in adults with Down syndrome as well that we always want to think about. So for instance, vision loss, vision impairment, hearing loss or hearing impairment, and then uh, conditions that can present at any time in individuals with Down syndrome, uh, such as hypothyroidism. In, as individuals with Down syndrome, we do see as well that there tends to be a higher risk for uh, thin bones or osteoporosis. Um, and as our adults with Down syndrome tend to get older, they tend to lose weight later in life. Uh, and so during later adulthood, becoming underweight uh, and maintaining weight with an important, uh, uh, with an appropriate diet and uh, sufficient physical activity levels becomes particularly important with our uh, individuals with Down syndrome as they age. <laughs> That's interesting. So that is a bit of a shift then from earlier adulthood and even childhood where the weight issues tend to be in the other direction where more children are having an, more of an overweight issue. So there's a big shift there. Yeah, we, we do see this. We tend to see this sort of parabolic curve uh, during oh. the lifespan of Down mm. syndrome, whereas in very early infancy, often there can there can be concerns for underweight with mm. poor feeding and muscle tone and coordination. Yeah. Then, as we know, in uh, adolescence and adulthood, there tends to be a concern for overweight and obesity, uh, both for metabolic reasons as well as uh, lifestyle, diet, and physical activity reasons. And then later in adulthood, we see them dip back down into the risk for underweight. So weight is, is, a, is a constant concern in, in Down syndrome, but for different reasons at different stages of their lives, which is, is quite unique and interesting. Yeah. Uh, when we look at our patients with Down syndrome and our loved ones with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. Well, that was news to me. I'm going to look out for that now. Um, mm -hmm. I also wanted to clarify some terminology before we get too far into our topic. Could you just clarify for our listeners the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia, please? Yeah, so that's a great question. So Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia. When we say dementia, we we use it generally... Uh, fairly generally as a sort of bucket term for conditions where memory declines and, and function declines over time. Uh, Alzheimer's is a specific type of dementia where we tend to see uh, certain uh, biological findings. Traditionally, it was diagnosed post-mortem, uh, so on the autopsy, where there would be certain findings on the brain on the autopsy. We tend to uh, diagnose Alzheimer's clinically now um, as well, 
Uh, it's, it's less of a, a firm diagnosis, but we feel confident mm -hmm. that clinically we see, uh, we can see some of the same findings that we see with other types of Alzheimer's. And we see that in Down syndrome because we know that there's a, on that extra copy of the 21st chromosome, there are uh, precursors for certain proteins that individuals with uh, Alzheimer's disease develop. And we think that that probably plays a role as to why individuals with Down syndrome are more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than the general population because they have that extra copy of chromosome 21 that produces those proteins that can deposit in the brain and cause yeah. Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, and I think this is why so much research on Alzheimer's is surrounding you know, the population of individuals with Down syndrome. So it's really interesting how our guys have become kind of like this cohort of people to, to, to use as a way to figure out what the mechanics of Alzheimer's is. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Is, so you said more <clears throat> likely in your last answer that you just gave. And so I want to provide a little window of hope for our families. Um, is Alzheimer's disease, disease an inevitable part of aging in Down syndrome at this point? Another great question. It is not. Uh, so we do know that the prevalence uh, of Alzheimer's disease is increased compared to the general population in individuals with Down syndrome and the risk of developing dementia or Alzheimer's type dementia increases with age, with each decade of life. But the the uh, it is not an absolute certainty uh, that one will develop Down syndrome, uh, will develop Alzheimer's disease as one ages. I mean, that's good news because for a while, yeah. I think that the public understanding or at least the in Down syndrome community understanding was that it was inevitable and that is, you know, not something to look forward to. I guess we can put it lightly there. So, yeah, and, that, and that's important when we when we counsel families and, and caregivers and we discuss this topic with them, uh, we do we do of course want to inform them of the increased risk um, because uh, there are obviously uh, medical complications as well as important social uh, discussions to be had. But we do also want to reassure them that not everyone with Down syndrome will develop Alzheimer's disease. It is not an inevitability because there can be a lot of uh, misunderstanding in, in, mm -hmm. uh, out there in the, sort of in the lay, uh, lay mm -hmm. media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think in my conversations with some of our younger families, they've said that, you know, when they get the diagnosis or when they go for that first checkup with their doctor, it's always brought up as an inevitability, yeah. you know? So like, I think you know, a lot of it is educating some of the, the pediatricians that work with our population that you have to, you know, explain the nuance just as beautifully as you did, that it's not an inevitability and that there's lots of things that you can do throughout their lifespan to help you know, delay the inevitability or to stave it off altogether. So I think that's a really important component as well. Absolutely. And it, it's a really sad thing when we have parents of two and three-year-olds coming in saying they're going to have Alzheimer's. Yeah. I mean, yeah, wow. Yeah. They have a whole life yeah. to live, right? So mm -hmm. thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, yeah. So what are some of the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease that parents and caregivers, you know, can look out for? Can behavior look different between, you know, having an, an Alzheimer's diagnosis versus normal aging in the Down syndrome population? Sure. Another great question. Uh, before I, I guess I, before I jump into the sort of signs and symptoms, I just want to set the stage a little bit. So, um, Alzheimer's disease is sort of suspected on our, what we call differential or something that we're always on the lookout for kind of around 40 and older and sometimes 35 and older, we're having more proactive anticipatory conversations with families. But generally speaking, there's a change or a series of changes seen in the individual compared to their previous level of functioning or their baseline ability. So um, it usually presents as like a constellation of a few things, which I'll get into in a moment. But I want to highlight two amazing publications uh, from the National Down Syndrome Society. Uh, they are handbooks that are accurate, up to date. They talk about aging and wellness in individuals with Down syndrome, in addition to a second publication specifically related to Alzheimer's and Down syndrome, also from the uh, National Down Syndrome Society. And I'll share those resources with you. But 
Uh, those are two great one-stop shop sort of resources to go to for what does this look like? What are some of the considerations, some of the touch points that we're going to talk about today? Okay. Um, so the, the biggest thing I think Dr. O and I sort of talk about is the importance of an accurate diagnosis. So really making sure that you see people who understand and have experience in individuals with intellectual disability and more specifically Down syndrome. Um, and that can be kind of hard to find depending on where you live. There's a lot of variability if you're near a healthcare center, if you're not, uh, if you're near a Down syndrome clinic, that can really impact things. And then some places don't even have access to care in the same way that we do, for example, in Boston, Massachusetts. So there's a lot of variability um, in that. And then we want to think about the co-occurring conditions that can mimic or masquerade, which Dr. O will get into a little bit in the diagnostic process in a moment, but that might sort of look like this. And then there may be a few things going on, right? There may be mm -hmm. memory changes um, and maybe some signs, but there might be some co-occurring conditions as well. So education's uh, really important. So we're talking about anticipating as part of growing older um, that we're having these conversations with patients and families. Uh, so most specifically what we see, and I know that you two can kind of speak to some of these as an OT in a speech is, a decreased ability to perform everyday tasks, such as self-care skills, activities at daily living. Uh, we often see expressive um, word finding difficulties where receptive language can change. They might have difficulty understanding two-step verbal directions, uh, more difficulty with complex steps that need to be breaking down. You may see misplacing things, uh, confusion with time and place. So if Susie wakes up and every day for 15 years, she's known to make her sandwich in a certain way and pack her lunch in a certain way. And then all of a sudden you start to see that she's not doing that routine. That may be a clue for you. Mm -hmm. And then the big thing that I'm typically on the lookout uh, with the physician, if there's no sort of medical comorbidities is changes in behavior and personality. So it might be an exaggeration of longstanding traits. So one example we see is, Self-talk is incredibly common in our population. We know it's a quite healthy and adaptive skill for our folks with Down syndrome to help them navigate a complex world, make sense of emotions, or uh, unpack their day, and it's just a way to fill boredom. But sometimes we see personality changes in adults with Down syndrome where there might be signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's where that self-talk might take on a devaluation tone or mm -hmm. negative tone, or they might become more aggressive in their tone. And that might be sort of a clue for something to look at. And they may not be Alzheimer's and it may, but it's sort of on what we call our differential. Um, and then there's really common mental health conditions such as anxiety, depression, OCD, and behavior disturbances that kind of can go along or be a co-occurring factor to consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think a lot of the things that you have mentioned are things that you're observing in behavior and you know things that you would see every day as part of your routine that shifts. Um, some medical professionals, you know, challenge the notion that there is a connection between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. Is there a specific, like, more objective, like, you know, blood work or scans or something that we could look for that definitively, to some degree, definitively says, no, it is not normal aging and Down syndrome, it is actually Alzheimer's disease? So it's still a, a diagnostic, a clinical diagnosis at this point. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as I mentioned, I mean, there are some uh, research tools that people use uh, to try and um, ascertain whether it's more likely to be Alzheimer's disease versus uh, another type of dementia. Um, I think that it, when, we, when we look to see whether it's dementia uh, versus uh, just normal aging process, we're looking at a lot of the things that Chloe is talking about. So the rapidity of the decline, the pervasiveness of the decline, the types of areas in their life that are being impacted and the ability to function with activities of daily living and increased mm -hmm. support that they need. Um, and that will, those, the combination of those factors will often tell us whether it's normal aging versus dementia. Um, and then uh, for, uh, for patients who we feel it's dementia, we then try and uh, diagnose it more formally um, and uh, we'll do that often with a screening tool um, and, and okay. as a questionnaire. 
So for the diagnostic process, um, it's, it's really important to do this because we know that there's an increased prevalence uh, of Alzheimer's type dementia uh, in individuals with Down syndrome. And so in, in, in Mass General in Boston at our program, we screen all patients starting at the age of 40 and we screen them every year annually for dementia. Uh, screening regularly is really important because if you look for something once, if a tool is not 100% accurate, you may miss it. But if you do it mm -hmm. repeatedly over time, you're more likely to catch that, uh, catch that abnormality if it's present. Um, yeah. And we, you know, we we start at age 40, um, which is uh, when the prevalence for dementia begins to increase. And that that that's our baseline, if you will. And, and establishing a baseline is really important so we can know where someone uh, how someone is functioning and what their capacity is before they begin to decline, if they do decline. Um, and then we screen every year when we see them. Uh, and we do this, we do it objectively with sort of an objective validated questionnaire. Uh, and the one we use is the Adaptive Behavior Dementia Questionnaire, the ABDQ, which is a screening questionnaire that's been developed for Alzheimer's disease type dementia and has been validated in individuals with Down syndrome. Uh, it's really important when you use a tool that you use the appropriate tool. So using mm -hmm. a, a tool that will be able to pick up and identify dementia is sensitive enough to identify those changes. And then B, with our population of patients, using a tool that will work in individuals with Down syndrome. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, the, uh, the changes can be different and how caregivers perceive those changes can be different in individuals with Down syndrome than without Down syndrome. So using a, a, a tool that's been validated is important and using a tool that is appropriate for the population that you're looking at is important as well. We also marry that, that when we get that information, then we marry that information with a subjective history or sort of the narrative uh, that the family uh, is giving us. So all the things that Chloe was talking about how uh, the changes that the, that the family or caregivers have noticed and how that's impacted uh, the individual's uh, functioning in life. Mm -hmm. um, and if we feel it's necessary, we will then refer the patient for neuro, more uh, in-depth neuropsychologic testing. Mm -hmm. I have um, I have two questions for you based on what you both have just said. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about weight being on a parabolic curve for individuals with Down syndrome, and I'm wondering if behavior takes the same curve. Do we start seeing an increase um, in the behaviors that were seen when the child was younger? We know that behavioral challenges are very common in sort of preschool, school age children with Down syndrome with a decline in those behaviors as they reach adulthood. And so do we expect the same types of behavior to come back in older adulthood if we're worried about dementia? Yeah, another good question. So there's a lot of variability, but generally we're always on the lookout because there is a higher risk for behavior challenges or what we call behavior disturbances, specifically if there is an Alzheimer's dementia formal diagnosis, there can be kind of a behavioral disturbance piece, which may look like anything from um, aggressiveness, sort of uh, that devaluation with the self-talk that I talked a little bit earlier, up through uh, repetitive routines that now take longer and start interfering with their daily activity and maybe mm -hmm. move into the OCD type realm where it's really hard to get that individual um, to move on to another activity where it's starting to cause them distress. That's very common. And then depression and anxiety. So um, that's a huge thing. And then we know with Alzheimer's is people lose sort of their skills in the way that are, you know, it's a progressive disease. So the, it will progress over time and that will sort of look different. So in that way, people with Down syndrome aren't always able to communicate. So we have to really look at behavior and behavior is sort of a form of communication and a clue for us. And we need to, as caregivers and providers, kind of play detective and really look at that thoughtfully and meaningfully. And what does that mean? Does that mean there's a trigger in the environment? Does it mean that there's frustration with communication? Um, and how can we kind of adapt and accommodate and make modifications to support and maximize independence, but also improve and continue to pay attention to quality of life? 
that answer. That was that was perfect. Um, I'm also wondering what rapidity of decline tells you about differential diagnosis in this instance. I think, Nicholas, you had mentioned rapidity as part of your mental checklist. Um, so what is that telling you if it's, you know, over the course of two weeks versus the two years? Yeah, that's a great question. So we typically see patients once a year so we, we tend to have a, a longer arc. And, and when we see a patient and a, a caregiver, we, you know, we ask them, how have things been going over the last year? Um, and so the usual cadence of slowing down is things slow down a little bit over a year, and that can be expected. Um, if we hear dramatic changes have happened over the last year in terms of activities of daily living, so able to feed oneself, or able to uh, bathe oneself or care for oneself, um, then we, you know, that that piques our attention, and, and we we begin to wonder whether there might be something else going on, either a medical condition causing a dramatic changes in activities of daily living, or uh, a, a psychiatric condition, psychological condition such as dementia, which we always, I mean, uh, uh, sorry, depression, which we always have to think about as well, or is it dementia? Um, and so. It, 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 there's a lot of different pieces of information that we want to hear about, but but the sort of the rapidity or the cadence of decline is one contributing factor that we pay attention to. Um, and you know, while we're talking about medical causes, this that this is important because this is something else that we try and um, figure out as well during uh, these visits. So, is the decline because of normal aging? Um, as uh, as a as an individual is getting older, they may slow down a little bit, and that we expect that to happen. Um, or is there something else going on? So, if if we hear from a caregiver that uh, uh, someone is an individual with Down syndrome has slowed down a little bit over the last year, um, and they're in their fifties or sixties, that is um, that is not unusual, and and that would be expected. Um, however, if we hear from a caregiver, for example, that an individual with Down syndrome at the same stage of life is uh, has had a dramatic change in their behaviors, and for instance, they may be getting lost now, or their activities are different than they were before they're not participating in activities anymore, then we start to ask why. Is it because there's something medical going on? Um, do we need to think about their sensory uh, 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 capacity, has their vision changed or their hearing changed dramatically, um, and they're not able to navigate the space in the world around them? Um, is there a reversible medical condition like a thyroid disease that's not well controlled, uh, that's uh, causing them uh, challenges in, in engaging in their activities of daily living? Is it depression um, or is it uh, dementia? Um, are they getting lost because uh, dementia is beginning to set in and they're not able, able to navigate their world that they knew well beforehand? So they're all, uh, those are all things that we consider um, and no one piece of data uh, is usually capable of providing a diagnosis. It usually requires multiple pieces of data uh, to, to get a better understanding of what's going on uh, in that uh, individual's life. And that's why repeated visits uh, over years and years and years um, where we get to know the patients and their caregivers can be so helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so happy that you mentioned some of the other things that could indicate a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And before I kind of move on to my next question, I wanted to confirm that you, you had mentioned, Dr. O, that around the age of 40 is when you would typically start tracking these activities of daily living and routine, like is that kind of where one would maybe at that age notice some Alzheimer's symptoms perhaps becoming more prevalent? Yeah, so we so actually Claude does a phenomenal job of tracking all those activities of daily living and, and uh, social supports needed from uh, infancy. But as a, as a mm -hmm. clinician, um, at the age of 40, that's when I really start focusing in on are there any potential uh, changes in activities of daily living that could be coming from uh, contributed to dementia? So generally speaking, yes. Uh, at the age of 40, that's when the risk for dementia in individuals with Down syndrome begins to increase. And that is the age where we start to um, focus on this as a potential diagnosis uh, at, yeah. at their annual visits. 
I would also I'm, add, we definitely are having these conversations in their 30s, um, but we're also providing yeah. reassurance that if someone comes in their 25, um, this is incredibly common. Parents are savvy. They know the, the, the link between uh, Down syndrome and dementia. And we have families coming in with 25-year-old loved ones and they're worried about it. So mm-hmm. as it comes up, we will have a conversation about it. But then there's also that side of reassurance that right now at 25, we're really focused on it, sort of something different. And then we don't need to worry about that right now. And we can do that sort of together down the road and really trying to yeah. help provide that anticipatory guidance, but also reassurance at the same time, depending yeah. on where they are in their lifespan. Definitely. And I think like the wheels are turning in my head and I'm sure knowing Marla that the wheels are turning in her head of like, okay, what can we do here at the DSRF? Because we do see so many, you know, our client list is across the lifespan. You know, we have clients in their thirties and in their forties. So it's really great I love that you're tracking ADL since their infancy. So we'll, you know, kind of making like a life kit, like a lifespan record of how they're able to do their daily activities and their routine so that we can really see when things may shift and we can pinpoint it. Um, But that's really great. And then like, um, Dr. O, you were talking about some of the other medical issues. I was just curious with sleep apnea being so prevalent in the Down syndrome population. Is there a correlation between obstructive sleep apnea and Alzheimer's disease, or what are your thoughts on that? Well, we certainly know that if you're if you have sleep apnea and it's not well controlled, it has an impact on cognition, right? So when we have sleep apnea, we are literally uh, our breathing stops during the night. And and when we're apneic, we are not delivering oxygen to our brain. Um, And so when our brain is starved of oxygen, um, as you can imagine, uh, that is not good for cognition. Um, And so one of the important things that we discuss with families is if you have sleep apnea, we really want to make sure that that's optimized. Um, And different patients are treated with different modalities, but whatever modality the patient is treated with, we want to make sure that their sleep apnea is optimized so that we can mitigate both the risk of getting uh, Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And if the patient already does have dementia, we want to uh, optimize their brain function as much as possible. Um, So that is is certainly uh, important and part of our discussion. And if a patient does not have a diagnosis of uh, sleep apnea, but is displaying symptoms, then we want to make sure that that patient is evaluated for sleep apnea mm-hmm. with a home sleep study test or an in-house sleep study test, depending on the needs and the patient's preferences. Yeah, great. I would just add, awesome. you, can, you can see how complex and thoughtful you need to be in the diagnosis, because even if obstructive sleep apnea is on board for a patient, we're looking at dementia, I'm also looking at mood and is are these symptoms because of obstructive yeah. sleep apnea? Is that is it depression? Is it dementia? Are there a few things going on? So you really have to unpack that from uh, an interplay of medical and otherwise uh, to mm-hmm. get a sense mm-hmm. of what's really going on. That was exactly yeah. my thought process. I was just yeah. thinking it must be so difficult to unpick depression versus dementia in this particular patient population because the overlap is large and the communication is challenging or low. Um, wow. That's, yeah. That sounds difficult. Well, Do you ever end up breeding a depression in as sort of a trial run to see if that. Well, we, we can, we take a multi-pronged approach, I, I would say. So we're privileged enough to, at the NGH Down syndrome program in Boston that we have. Um, so I see patients together in a cold visit with Dr. Ruskovic annually for adults. And then we also have a neuropsychologist who does the objective testing for uh, the diagnosis if we have sort of suspicion for it or they screened positive sort of in clinic with our um, instrument that Dr. O just described. But then we also have a psychiatrist too. So mm-hmm. it sort of depends. Every individual is different. Some families say, let's start with the medical aspect of tackling OSA first and then see if that helps. But the reality is, is that many people with Down syndrome can't tolerate a CPAP. And so then there's, you know, some patients where that's not an option and maybe it's dementia and um, a psychiatric piece. Maybe there's some comorbidity going on. And then we're referring for um, additional evaluation by subspecialists, subspecialists, essentially. Yeah. And I guess it would also 
depend on how severe the behavior is, right? So some things might require medical intervention first just to kind of get to baseline, and then you would have to put other things off for later. So Exactly. Yeah, so if you're seeing like behavior disturbances where the person's injuring themselves, then obviously that's yeah. a safety issue and we need to address that first yeah. from a yeah. Um, you know, safety standpoint. But yeah, it's so variable really depending on the individual's particular situation. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's Great. so true that um, several of these conditions can mimic themselves as well. And so, you know, the other thing that I didn't mention, but when we screen for dementia, we actually also at the same time do a screen for depression because we know that the two can present similarly. And we want to make sure that if we are saying that we think someone has dementia, it's not because we're misdiagnosing depression as dementia and mm-hmm. vice versa. Mm-hmm. So important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The overlap so, is, yeah. I'm sure challenging. Yes. Yeah. I'm, right now I'm just really heartfelt wishing that you guys were over here. I know. <laughs> I was like, how do we get <laughs> work with you closely? Um, but wishes aside, let's change track a little bit and think about lifestyle choices and he- sort of the healthy routines more on the preventative side of what can be done so that we try and avoid this tangle of, depression, dementia, that kind of thing. So what can we do to prevent or delay the onset of Alzheimer's in our population? Yeah, great, great question. I mean, I think that, you know, we've talked a little bit about this uh, in the beginning, but really the most important thing is is promoting a a healthy brain environment. Um, And so when we're talking about a healthy brain environment, we're talking about the strategies that we uh, recommend for maintaining good mental health in people with Down syndrome and good physical health in people with Down syndrome. These are the same strategies that work for the general population, um, including eating well, being physically active, having good social relationships with, with, uh, with your loved ones and your friends, sleeping sufficiently and sleeping well, um, and being occupied in meaningful activities. Um, how we achieve those Uh, aims can be a little bit different in individuals with Down syndrome, but the general approach uh, and the general uh, factors that go into that are very similar. Um, And so first and foremost, we want to try and promote that lifestyle from an early uh, early time in life, uh, both for uh, uh, our individuals with Down syndrome and their families and caregivers, and really stress the importance of developing these healthy habits early in life. Um, and then as an individual ages, we want to be, we want to uh, try and ensure that they uh, maintain those healthy habits and optimize them as much as possible. Um, so that would be the first thing. Um, really, you know, really stressing the importance of making sure someone's getting sufficient physical activity every day, making sure that their diet is healthy, making sure they're sleeping enough, that they're using their uh, positive airway pressure machine if they have one for their sleep apnea. So that's the most important thing I would say. Um, The other thing that's important, obviously, is if they have medical conditions, we want to make sure that uh, those conditions are being treated, right? So if someone has hypothyroidism, they should be on their thyroid replacement medication. Um, If someone has uh, sleep apnea, the sleep apnea should be treated, et cetera. A lot of these conditions, uh, if they're not treated well enough um, can or adequately sufficiently, they can have an impact on cognition as well or on an individual's desire to uh, be physically active or eat healthy foods. So if someone has depression and it's not sufficiently treated, they may not uh, want to um, get out of uh, their space. They may be uh, less likely and less inclined to engage in physical activity, and that can then have a downward effect on their cognition. So it's important to treat the medical and uh, psychiatric conditions, um, but at the same time, not to lose focus that uh, the, the really the fundamentals here are eating healthy, exercising, sleeping, mm-hmm. having good social relationships, all the things that we tell everyone in the general population to do as well. Yeah. And I feel like COVID has probably, you know, thrown everybody. Uh, I've had so many conversations with parents with who have um, adults, kids with Down syndrome, where everything is thrown off. So the, you know, the motivation to do what you want to do is down. So it's really, you know, I'm sure you're noticing that with at your clinics as well, how much of an impact COVID has had. 
in those healthy routines. Yeah. Yeah. We're actually seeing it in the same conversation that we're having. So we just had a patient, Dr. O and I last week where um, had some changes in his functioning, but we really thought it was pandemic COVID related changes versus the caregivers, you know, knew about the link and there there did not appear to be sort of what we call a constellation of symptoms that would be concerning. And they scored negative on the dementia screening that we just talked about. And really at that time felt that it was more COVID related. So you really have to look at the environmental stressors as a huge part of this, uh, especially for people with Down syndrome who can be really sensitive to change and change in routine and lack of structure and lack of routine, uh, most specifically currently because of the pandemic, but yeah. And even just lack of opportunity. You know, oh, yep. A lot mm-hmm. of our families who worked so hard to build these complex social structures of support for their individuals. And then everything's kind of been gone for a coming up on two years and you can't go out and you might get sick and a lot of stress for every family, but then nothing to do. Right. Like no exactly. mm-hmm. it's really a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been very challenging during the pandemic for our families um, for all the reasons you stated. Um, and then a lot of our patients are in day programs during adulthood as well. And yeah. with all the staffing challenges that have been occurring during the pandemic, a lot of our patients are, don't have the opportunity to go to those day programs. Um, and so they're not getting that opportunity to socialize. They're not getting that opportunity to be physically active. Um, and it has had a profound impact on our patients. And it's not something that families should sort of beat themselves up about. I'm, I'm glad that you yeah. brought it up because it, it, it seems to be a universal. Every family that we see here has been impacted in that way. And there's nothing to be done really about it mm-hmm. except work on rebuilding them when it's safe to do so. Yeah. And so we encourage, you know, when we discuss this and when we hear about this, we really try and encourage families to find novel ways to um, to get our patients and to get our individuals with Down syndrome back out into the community, back out outside. You know, as long as they're wearing a mask, we encourage them to be vaccinated, of course. And if they wear a mask, um, it's okay. It's, you know, they're protect, They're as protected as they're going to be. Um, and we really feel that there's just an inherent value and importance of them uh, having those activities that they had before. Um, and so, we discuss things like trying to find novel ways for them to go outside, uh, to be physically active, um, and uh, to reestablish relationships, social relationships, perhaps new relationships, new activities. Um, but it, it's important, and we, we can't put that aside for a pandemic, which we are now entering into our third year, who would have thought? Um, and we just don't know what's what's coming next. So, yeah. So you're saying and there's I think- no point in waiting, right? Yeah. 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 And I think the pandemic has opened up the eyes of a lot of people without Down syndrome because I personally have really understood on a small scale what it must be like to constantly have things changing around you, to be rid of your routine, the uncertainty. So I've had many conversations with parents where I'm like, you know how you're feeling right now during the pandemic? This is what they feel like almost every day, right? Not knowing what's going to happen and things changing, even the littlest bit, and you get anxiety. So I think it's been a real eye-opener for a lot of us with respect to how our, our students and our adults kind of have to go through on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. With not understanding yeah. the changes mm-hmm. that are happening around them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's good. I think, Hina, you can take it back over. Sure, yeah. yeah. So kind of, you know, we're so used to working on skill development. At what point do we stop working on skill acquisition, uh, but you know, yet prevent excess um, disability. Because where's the line, Chloe? Yeah, I have some thoughts on that. So um, I think when, I, first, is there a diagnosis of dementia? I think we need to sort of always establish that first because of the nature of dementia. It's a progressive disorder, meaning that it's expected that the individual's needs will increase over time. And obviously that's different for everyone. It certainly is possible to maximize independence and quality of life. But if someone has dementia, we should not be um, focusing on the acquisition of skills. It should be on maximizing their independence and their quality of life. 
Uh, we may need to make adjustments. Uh, expectations may need to be shifted. So, for example, um, if someone um, usually um, ask them what they want for breakfast, uh, maybe not asking an open-ended question and saying, would you like oatmeal or eggs? Or instead of saying, do you want to go to, to the library? Uh, you can shift that to be more declarative and say, let's go to the library. So um, there's usually modifications that need to be made. But generally speaking, uh, I would not say we're looking at the acquisition of skills. We should always set the um, bar high and continue to make sure that person's as independent as possible. But I don't think it's realistic to expect the acquisition of skills because by nature of the disease, there's a progression and loss of sort of skills. And that may look different for everyone, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and I, I mean, this sounds like it puts the onus of, of this huge job on the families. However, families don't necessarily, you know, have to go at it alone. Who in the community can support a family in setting up these routines and ensuring that they're kind of healthy routines that can last for a while? Sure. So the first thing I wanted to say sort of specifically to dementia is, as I mentioned, the sort of the variability of providers and trying to find a specialist who has experience with individuals is extremely important. So um, families will often say, well, who do I go to for that? So just want to highlight that it, that may look like, depending on where you live, it, how you have access to care. That may be a geriatrician, that may be a psychologist, that may be a neurologist, that may be a social worker like myself in conjunction with a physician. So it may look different. There's not a one size fits all for going about getting support and um, a workup if you are concerned about the diagnosis. So that's the first thing. And the second is that it's uh, a journey and you do need a circle of support and a support network kind of around you. And that's one thing we talk about quite often in clinic, and that can look like uh, care coordination or a team of primary care doctor, maybe a memory specialist, caregivers, day program people, possibly even in Massachusetts, we have state agency support, family and friends, of course. And obviously that's all uh, centered around the person with Down syndrome. So it's sort of identifying the circle of support for the individual with Down syndrome, I would say. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, as we're kind of nearing the end of this episode, I just, I, another quick question popped up in my mind, and I was just curious, um, in previous episodes, we have talked about the healthcare guidelines for younger, um, like ages, you know, um, in terms of what parents and caregivers need to be aware of. Um, is there any update to the adult health care guidelines that includes Alzheimer's and dementia in it? Any, any news on that at all? Yeah, so there, there is an adult health care guidelines that came out uh, uh, one year ago, I believe, maybe two years ago at this point. Um, and it does include a recommendation on screening for uh, adults with dementia on an annual basis, starting, uh, I believe, at the age of 40 is the recommendation. Okay, great, great. That's really good to know. I also just uh, wanted to yeah. clarify, sorry, Hannah. I also just no, wanted no. to clarify. So if families are seeing what they feel is loss of function or loss of participation, and they don't think it's the pandemic and their child is much younger, let's say later high school years, recently graduated early 20s, can we safely say that dementia is probably not it and that they should seek some other kind of differential diagnosis at that kind of age? Yeah. I have this parent, this question a lot from families. They're like, do you think it's the dementia? And I say no, but I want clarification from someone who actually knows um, what should they be looking out for if it's very young? Yes, that, that's a great question. So I would say that if you have a patient who's younger than 35, um, you can safely rule out dementia. We just don't see it presenting any earlier than that. Uh, really, mm -hmm. the, the prevalence starts to increase or the incidence starts to increase after the age of 40, really, for most mm -hmm. patients. So if they're younger than 35, you should be thinking about another uh, diagnosis that accounts mm -hmm. for the change in uh, behavior or cognition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, we don't we don't have the benefit here of like a, such a nice working group that you guys have at Mass General. So it does change like who you would send that person to and where you would make your referrals to. So that's really great information, especially for all of our listeners who are rural 
It's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. having access to resources is really important as well. Access to care. I mean, so you mentioned the the, the guidelines and recommendations. So it is true uh, that um, over the age of forty, we should be uh, screening our uh, patients with Down syndrome once a year for dementia. Um, but a lot of our, you know, a lot of patients with Down syndrome on, only see their primary care doctor. Yeah. And uh, in the general population with primary care. Uh, populations and patients, you know, as primary care doctors, we don't screen our patients every year for dementia, and that's not recommended either. So, um, you know, it, it's just, it's a, an awareness thing. Unfortunately, not everyone with Down syndrome has access to a specialty clinic. Um, so there is a, a, a degree of uh, self-advocacy, unfortunately, that, that families with Down syndrome have to do for uh, their loved ones. Um, there are some resources out there um, there is the Down Syndrome Clinic, Down Syndrome to You Clinic, uh, which is an online uh, option that's that's tailored, and and I think Chloe can speak really well to this. Um, but um, resources like those online resources or specialty clinics are places where uh, families, if they have questions that are specific to Down Syndrome, can go to get answers. Fantastic, yeah, yeah and especially if you're us- presenting. Yeah especially if you're presenting to the primary care as your first step and you may not even have access to a Down syndrome specialty clinic like we do here. So that's a lot for a pediatrician to sort of start with or a primary care doctor uh, to start with. Uh, Those visits are short as Dr. O knows. So um, yeah, and And that leads us and are they're complex. Yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. And it's funny that, I mean, yes, we don't have a specialty clinic per se, but even the fight to even get a sleep apnea referral is is a hard one. So, you know, we've had to write so many letters of referral and have had printed so many copies of the healthcare guidelines to be able to show them. Mm-hmm. And I'm so happy that, that the Alzheimer's referral is in the adult healthcare guidelines because at least it gives you a parents a document saying that this is something that happens and that this is something that needs to be, you know, checked. So it kind of empowers them with that. So that's really great to know that that's included. Um, and yeah, and Dr. Oak and Chloe kind of, you've mentioned a couple of resources, Chloe, from the National Down Syndrome Society that we'll have on our episode page. We've talked about the Down Syndrome Clinic too, which is a fantastic resource. Are there any others that you would recommend um, to our listeners? Sure. So I have kind of what I call a whole toolbox of resources that I share in clinic and then I, uh, both sort of um, connecting to national organizations and uh, individuals with other providers who provide care for individuals with intellectual disability and then more practical things. So I mentioned the two from the National Down Syndrome Society. I can make sure to send you uh, this information and maybe you can put it in the podcast. Yes. Uh, The one is the the big one is that if you want a more publicly available tool, for example, if you don't have access to care, there's certainly the Down Syndrome Clinic to you, but the National Task Group um, in Early Detection Screen for Dementia is widely available, and that was sort of put together for individuals with Down syndrome and intellectual disabilities. So that's a screening tool that you can have access to publicly, and I'll include that in the list of resources. Um, of course, there's research and clinical trials that families are asking about, and Blue Mind um, Down Syndrome Foundation in Boston is another good resource. Down Syndrome Clinic to you, we've mentioned. And then there's a couple podcasts that I often share. Um, Dr. Peter Belova just did a recent one. And then uh, Dr. Brian Scacco, our medical director, just did one. So kind of putting your feelers out there for the podcasts in the community are also important because this is how I learn. This is how caregivers learn. Um, And then Alzheimer's Association, I'm not sure what it looks like in Canada, but is a wonderful organization Um, If you do have a diagnosis and you're looking for more support, I often partner with them. And then there's a, a, you know, a couple other resources I can certainly share as maybe part of the follow-up after the visit, but there are lots of resources that are available for caregivers. um, So they're out there. Do you ever um, get your caregivers in a group? Do you create support groups among the family members, I guess is what I'm asking, because it is a pretty particular thing to be a part of the Down syndrome community and then also to have this additional older age diagnosis. Is that kind of support available? Yeah, certainly. So 
Yes, in Boston, Massachusetts, and again, that's variable, but I partner very closely with two organizations for family support. We can't do it alone. So there's the um, New Hampshire, Massachusetts Alzheimer's Association. I often consult with a social worker there. They have a dementia care coordination program specifically that can help families navigate the system in collaboration with our team. There is the National um, Down Syndrome Organizations have a lot of information and support both virtually and otherwise. And then um, in Massachusetts, we're lucky to have the Massachusetts Down Syndrome Congress, which is our local nonprofit advocacy agency. So I know some states have those and they're doing a lot of great work as well. And oftentimes we'll have support groups. And then social media is obviously an easy way to connect uh, since we're all spread all over the world. And there are Facebook groups specific to this topic as well. So lots of ways to connect. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Dr. Oreskovich and Claude, thank you so much. Um, kind of before we end things, do you have any last words of advice for practitioners like Marla and myself or for parents or caregivers or listeners in general in terms of, you know, how we can help this amazing population of individuals with Down syndrome when they're struggling with something like Alzheimer's? Any last words we would love? I would say for caregivers specifically, knowledge is power in the, uh, being proactive and sort of having conversations over the lifespan versus waiting um, until maybe a crisis or something more unmanageable erupts is extremely important from my perspective. That's one, one, one small thing. Yeah. And I, I would say, I think um, related to managing expectations, just helping Families understand the uh, the disease course um, if it is dementia and what what they can expect. Um, and uh, if we're not certain that it is dementia, um, really doing the due diligence to make sure that there's nothing else going on, um, and that if there is another co-occurring medical condition, that that's optimized uh, and that we're treating that as well as possible, um, so that it doesn't contribute to exacerbation of the dementia if the dementia is present. Fantastic. We appreciate so much that you both have come today to meet with us and thank you so much. Thank you, it was great to meet you both and thank you for having us. It was, it was a, um, a, a great topic and no a hard topic, but an important topic. So thank you. Thank you for Absolutely. having us. This was a real pleasure, yeah. real, real fun you. to participate in.